Yes. Testimony is under right. Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's, it's a little wet, but that makes it fresh. And I think it provides just enough of a challenge to us. If For those of us that have animals and have to corral them out, I had to wipe 12 little paws this morning. None of my dogs are a big fan of the rain, but uh, it just reminded me as I'm bending over, cleaning them up, thinking... I'm going to be so happy in heaven when we don't have to deal with anything like this. So it was, it was a nice reminder, and sometimes we need those. 
So we're going to start with a couple of songs. I was able to get um, a couple suggestions, and we are going to start with Richard's favorite song, 529, Under His Wings. to be 425. This was also someone else's suggestion. I'm not sure who, but um, I'm not familiar with this one, so it's going to be nice to hear a new song. Holy, holy is what the angels sing.
that we would open with 577. It's a place where I hope that we all can feel especially close to today in the heart of Jesus. And then if we could do something just a little different, Maureen, after the um, mission spotlight and the mission story, can we sing one more? I found one that would open our lesson study perfectly. Thank you. So in the heart of Jesus. Thank you so much for singing. So I thought we would just open our Sabbath school service with prayer. If you would bow your heads with me. Our Father, we thank you so much for giving us Jesus that shows us your great love and that we don't have to feel like we are without a mediator, that we are without a high priest, that we are without the opportunity to come boldly to your throne. We thank you for bidding us, and we ask that you will enlighten us, draw us close to you, correct us where we need corrected, and expound our understanding where we need to learn more, and help us to do so with loving arms around each other, lifting one and up for encouragement. Be with those that can't make it here today, that are that are studying on their own or watching from their homes. I just ask that you will bring peace and love to their hearts on your blessed Sabbath day and let us worship you in an acceptable way. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start with our mission spotlight. When disaster strikes, the most vulnerable often struggle the most. The year 2020 will always be remembered as one of the most challenging times in modern history. The COVID-19 pandemic put low-income families around the world in difficult positions. Some have been unable to provide for their families' most basic needs and put food on the table. Many countries went into lockdown to try to slow the spread of the coronavirus. In the Philippines, 
the sudden closure of stores and other facilities, as well as the abrupt drop in tourism, caused low-income families to lose their jobs. They struggled to meet their basic needs, which included buying a staple food, rice. This quickly caught the attention of Dr. Samuel Wang, an evangelist in the Southern Asia Pacific region. He coordinated a fundraising project to help those who were most affected. When we learned the situation, we are greatly agitated. We want to thank our God. It is His love that motivated us and inspired us. No matter where we are, we are all together because we are one family in the Lord. Thank the Lord for His great love, and also thank the love of our brothers and sisters. Dr. Wang's team worked hard to give out sacks of rice. During the first distribution, over 1,200 families received rice and Adventist literature. Community members such as tricycle drivers, care group members, and utility personnel came to collect this critical food for their families. The team adhered to recommended social distancing protocols and safety health measures to prevent the spread of the disease. Despite risk to their own health, they believed that God was leading them to care for others. As we know from March 15, the Philippines is locked down and we understand the people in, in uh, everywhere near the capital is uh, having a difficult time. And especially in Silang over here, the tricycle drivers, their business is all shut down. And they don't even have any rice and food at home. So we heard, uh, we understand the situation and uh, we try to raise some funds to help them. So finally, uh, within 11 hours, we have the money we need to supply for uh, 2,000 families over here. For each family, we would provide 10 kilo, uh, kg uh, rice. So that will help them to go through the difficult time until the lockdown is over. Care group leaders at the Southern Asia Pacific Division headquarters submitted the names of families they knew who potentially needed food assistance underprivileged families living in shanties and makeshift houses in six different locations in Silong were some of the recipients of the rice donations. The second batch of rice distribution was organized four days later for nearly 900 families. 400 sacks of rice were given out in total. Adventist literature was included because the team wanted to minister to the people's spiritual needs too. So our members in different places take the opportunity. This is the right time that we can really minister to people in their needs. And this, we are just following steps of Jesus Christ, that he spent his time for the poor, healing them, uh, helping them in their difficulties. So this is what Seventh Adventist is all about. As a tricycle driver, receiving this 10 kilograms of rice is something really special to us. I am thankful. I am overwhelmed to receive this gift from the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our mission story is part two of Forgiving Mother. And if you recall last week, it, it commenced with um, Charmaine. She's our protagonist <laughs> or the main character in this story. Um, and um, having some issues with a relationship with her mother due to her mother's disdain for, uh, I guess, one of her suitors in her youth. And um, sounds like Charmaine is probably much like all of us, and I'll just include myself into that. We, we, tend, to, we tend to forgive sparingly, but want forgiveness in abundance. So we'll go on with part two. So... After Charmaine surrendered her life to Christ in Malaysia, she realizes that she needed to honor her mother as instructed by the fifth commandment. But her struggle is how. I prayed fervently for two long years about this sin of mine, and sometimes I even questioned God. Oh Lord, 
How are you going to change me, I prayed. Please do something. My two younger siblings returned home to Malaysia for a big family reunion in late 2018. My sister and her husband arrived from the United States and my little brother came from Thailand. It was a rare occasion to have the whole family together because we live so far apart. My little brother, Luther, who is 11 years younger than me, noticed my conflict with my mother. On the day that he flew back to Thailand, he left a letter for me in my morning devotional book, and I found it, the letter the next morning, and Luther wrote, It is with a heavy heart that I am writing this letter. Letter, I give thanks and praise to God that you have learned many truths and that have brought, that have brought a positive change in your life. It is indeed a joy to see my sister walking in the path of ministry, something that I am proud of and I look up to when I look to you. Glory and praise be to God. After praying and contemplating in my sinful and imperfect state, I managed to muster up some courage to write to you from my heart regarding your dealings and in relationship with our mother. I understand that our mother is imperfect. She can be unreasonable at times and she does get on our nerves. Yet she is our mother and that our perfect God has given to us to love, to treat with respect, and to obey. I know it well that our mother has her flaws, but her intent has always been to mother her children whom she cares for. Perhaps we may never have the privilege of understanding fully why she does what she does. I fear that you do not realize that you have an impulsive attitude toward our mother that can be unreasonable and show fruits of impatience, ego, and pride. I fear also that this could be a potential stumbling block for people around you when they see how you treat and speak to our mother. Again, I write this with a heavy heart and with the intention of reprimanding my sister who I love and care for. I may not have delivered this well, but I trust and pray that the Holy Spirit will personally speak to your heart and give you the spirit of reconciliation. Take care, much love and prayer, your baby brother. Oh... After reading the letter, I wept for more than an hour, pleading with God for forgiveness and at the same time praising him for speaking to me through my brother. While my carnal self still wants dis to dishonor my mother, I have not been able to raise my voice at mother since that day, so God has answered my prayers. As he promised, then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart of their flesh and give them a heart T sorry, take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Ezekiel eleven nineteen. My broken relationship with my mother was restored, though, through the power of the Holy Spirit. I praise God for mending our relationship before I left home. Just six days after receiving my brother's letter, I flew to Western Malaysia to attend a church-organized Bible training school. Mother took me to the airport. I gave her a goodbye hug. It was the first hug that I had given her in more than 10 years. Six months later, I moved to Thailand and started working as a kindergarten teacher at the Adventist International Mission School in the city of Korat. No one probably would have blamed me if I had left home without resolving the conflict of, with mother. I think I might have. I don't know if she's... She seems to be very dismissive of this, but... But God did not allow my cherished sin to prevail. God, in his perfect time, worked a miracle in my life and allowed this sin to be completely cleansed from me before I moved to Thailand. So thank you for your 13th Sabbath offering three years ago that helped Charmaine's fast-expanding school, Adventist International Mission School, expand into a high school and construct a complex of classrooms and other buildings on a new site in Krat. Thank you for your prayers for the school children and for Charmaine and other teachers. So something that sort of resonated with me in this, I'm, and I'm, I'm looking at it, maybe it might be a little bit different culturally um, where they are, but I think of my own mother, and yeah, this would not have flown with her. <laughs> if I had gone 10 years without hugging her because I was holding a grudge, she would have hauled me down, and we would have sat down and hashed it out. She, she was not having any of this. So as much as I'm trying, I'm, I'm having a hard time identifying with her, it, it is helping because it's made me appreciate the tough love that my mom had. Um, she was 
an incredibly complex woman and was very authoritative and she had an exact way of running her house. And if you had took issue with it, well then you were uh, welcome to pay your own way. <laughs> so, and, and I respect that, you know, this, she had a lot of children, a lot of foster children. She had to run a tight ship. And, um, and we used to joke, you know, she used to say that while you're under her roof, her roof, her rules, and she would strive to be fair and that if you could come up with a solution that wasn't disrespectful, she was willing to hear it. But otherwise, then, you know, like her menu that was posted in her kitchen, two items for dinner. Number one was take it and number two was leave it. It was your choice, <laughs> but it was still her home. So I, I am struggling, but I, I do appreciate the fact that um, her brother was able to reach out to her and, and touch her heart with opening it to the Holy Spirit for reconciliation. So we will continue on our journey into Charmaine's relationship with her mother on next Sabbath for last chance for God. So I thought we would go just a little bit different of a um, direction with our um, interesting facts about Thailand and where our story is coming from. And I'm an animal lover, so I, I like to go and find out what animals there are. And there are some amazing ones. So Thailand is a country with beautiful beaches, thick jungles, rivers, lakes, waterfalls, and plenty of national parks. The country's landscape is diverse and provides a habitat for several species of flora and fauna. The wildlife in the country ranges from big elephants to very small bugs and birds. Some animals can be seen roaming all over the country while some are protected in wildlife reserves. And these are some of the animals that are found in Thailand. So one of these is, it's called the clouded leopard. And if you've ever seen this, I highly encourage you to go take a look. It is magnificent. So the clouded leopard is native to Thailand and also several countries in Southeast Asia. It spends a large part of its life in trees and dense forests. The leopard is an elegant and agile animal that is a must-see for wildlife enthusiasts visiting Thailand. A majority of these animals can also be seen at the Khao Sok National Park. They have the longest canines of the living cats. Clouded leopards are categorized as a vulnerable species because of their numbers drastically reducing every year. And the next one, is called the oriental tree squirrel. So this is um, a giant squirrel. It's about the size of a domestic cat. I would be in my glory. I, I love squirrels, but I, I know a lot of people don't hold them as in high regard as I do. They consider them just a pest and vermin, but I have a, a squirrel feeder at my house that I got from the wildlife bird sanctuary. And it's it's like the Taj Mahal of, of squirrel feeders. And so some of my squirrels are a little overfed. They, they, kind of, they get a little chunky. So we've had to lower it because they were getting a little fat that they were having trouble climbing. So probably not the best, but. So this squirrel prefers dense forests where it just spends most of its time. And this is quite interesting. So when faced with danger, the squirrel flattens itself against the trunk of a tree instead of fleeing. It is more active in the early and late hours of the day, and they feed on fruit, flowers, bark, and nuts, and they are mostly found in the dense forest area of Thailand. So just a couple more I thought were really amazing is the, this is, I've never heard of this one, it's called a common tree shrew. The common tree shrew is a small mammal that's native to Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand. It is of least concern because its ability to adapt to new habitats. Common shrew tree shrews are more active during the day compared to at night. They can be seen foraging for food al alone or in pairs, in tree holes, shrubs, and on the ground. They feed on leaves, seeds, fruits, and insects, and they are found all over Thailand in areas with dense trees and bushes. So the last one that I'm gonna present to you is absolutely amazing and it is the tiger there's a special tiger that is um, 
Indo-Chinese tigers, and there's only about 600 left in the world. Heartbreaking, but half of the population is found in Thailand, and a third of that is found only in zoos. There's about a remaining 200 tigers that can be found in tropical forests, and there is a um, sanctuary called the Huao Kai Keong Wildlife Sanctuary, and it's globally known as the Tiger Sanctuary because of the large numbers of wild tigers that are located at the park. Conservists are, conser sorry, conserv conservationists are advocating for the release of the captured tigers because they are subjected to an unnatural environment in captivity and they think they would likely thrive in the wild. So it's a tricky, I guess, situation to know what's best to do for them. And I look forward to seeing some of these animals. I know that many of the variations are just done through what we've done over the years, but be interesting to see what the original tiger that God created looked like. So, so I apologize that the song that I was going to um, ask us to sing to open our Sabbath school les lesson, um, I thought for sure that it was in our hymnal, but it's not. So I'm just going to look it up and read it. I'm not sure if any of us know the, world, the words well enough that we could just sing it, um, but I will just read it to you, and you'll recognize as soon as I start. So this one is called, I Shall Not Be Moved. So it starts, Jesus is my savior, I shall not be moved. In his love and favor, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. In my Christ abiding, I shall not be moved. In his love I'm hiding, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that is planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. If I trust him ever, I shall not be moved. He will fail me never, I shall not be moved. And just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. On his word I'm feeding, I shall not be moved. He is the one that's leading, I shall not be moved. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. Anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved. Though all hell assail me, I shall not be moved. For Jesus will not fail me, I shall not be moved. Though the tempest rages, I shall not be moved. For on the rock of ages, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. So I apologize. I was so certain that that would be in the hymnal, but learned something new today. So our Sabbath school lesson today is our second to the last lesson, receiving an unshakable kingdom. So I will beg for your participation. Um, I had only a couple days to prepare this because I was... Uh, not let know till um, quite late that I had to find um, a replacement um, just some, due to an absence. So I'll just grab my note. Okay, so I will actually just ask, if I may, Marilyn, would you be so kind as to start us with a memory verse? And that's Hebrews 12, 28. That's the wrong one, just a minute. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace 
by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews 12, 28. So, we've got the theme, I think, for our uh, lesson this week is um, the shaking, being shaken, not being able to be shaken. And um, I noticed that um, it, We've sort of been creeping up to it, and this is the week that we finally examine the judgment work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. So, which is, I think, um, and I'm, I'm not sure why, but it seems like most everybody, but, you know, and us Adventists included, we tend to shy away from judgment. And I've noticed this week in, in doing my study that Judgment is a blessed event for those that are in Christ, that have had the, the covering of his righteousness. So I just wanted to read um, on our um, opening Sabbath the first paragraph because I think it sets the tone nicely. So Hebrews 12, 18 to 29, the passage for this week is the climax of the letter and it sums up its main concern by repeating the idea with which it started. God has spoken to us in the person of his son, and we need to pay careful attention to him. The description of Jesus in Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, epitomizes the letter's assertions about him. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, and his blood provides salvation for believers. His priestly and royal ministry in our behalf is cause for celebration for the heavenly hosts, and finally, Hebrews 12, 25 to 29 contains the last and climatic exhortation, God's judgment is coming. It will bring destruction to his enemies, but vindication and a kingdom to his people. So we have the emphasis on God's judgment coming and that as always, there's two groups. There is one I think that will look forward to the judgment, and then there are those that will be weighed in the balances and found wanting, and the judgment will be their final recompense, you know, the, the final sort of reward for, for the choices that they've made. So on Sunday, we touched about you have come to Mount Zion. So in reading um, Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, he um, Terry, would you read that for us? So that's Hebrews, Hebrews 12, uh, 22 to 24? Yes, please. Okay. But you are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So um, it says, what does Paul describe here? But I would like to focus on who, who is here? present at this judgment that Paul's speaking of that he's obviously pulling from other areas of scripture. I notice that there is a specific type of people that were here. In reading what? Yeah, it's um, the church of the firstborn, it says, and uh, those that have made, been made perfect, which is really something. And uh, if we understand it, we're, we look at ourselves and we say, Pfft, we're not perfect, <laughs> but in Christ we are. And it's uh, and just men made perfect. It's really something. So it's those that are saved are coming to the church of the firstborn, to Mount Zion, and they are saved. And uh, this judgment, like you said, it's a blessed thing for the righteous, a horrible thing for the, for the unrighteous. But for those that are uh, with Christ, this is something that we look for. We've desired. We don't want to see this uh, wickedness in this world anymore. The injustice, the, the cruelty, the murder, the, mm -hmm. oh, the horrible things. Let it. that end. Yeah. 
yeah. and let peace and, and love and, and joy and eternal life come. And uh, this is, the judgment's going to be the, prob finally the end of sin and Satan, so it's going to be beautiful. I noticed, too, that it seems to suggest that believers, believers come into the heavenly places and to a heavenly society here in this celebration. And I read on in a, in a commentary where it says that um, Mount Zion, the gospel church, is where God has graciously taken up his residence to rule, to guide, to sanctify, and to comfort his people. Christ brings us back to God, providing a way, his own blood, and pleads mercy for the sinner, and to the sinner, Christ pleads the name of the Father, his pardon, his peace, and his highest love. And I thought that's a beautiful way of capturing what we're celebrating here at this time. So um, I just thought it was interesting, um, the question at the bottom, in what practical ways can we celebrate the reality of Jesus, his priestly ministry, and the new covenant in our lives and in our worship? Why is rejoicing in this great truth faith affirming. Does anyone have any comments that they had thought on that question? Mm -hmm. uh, practical ways. Yes, that's, practical that's, ways. That's the key yeah. word, isn't it? Um, of course, we can do that with our lips to praise him, yeah. right? And that's very practical. But uh, <clears throat> I was thinking about this because I think it's somewhere in uh, Thursday. I can't, I, I forget where it is. It speaks about this already. And uh, so it, Jesus says, you, you draw nigh with me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. And so how do we do it in practical ways? When we feed the poor, when we close the naked, we send Bibles to North Korea. When we can do those things, it, and uh, I read... I actually copied the scriptures down. It said that uh, let your light so shine before the world so they may see your good works that my name might be glorified. So those good works that we do, and is any of those works going to save us? No. We could, we could you know, co collect all the good works of this church and put it on one person. It's still not going to scratch the surface. But it puts a smile on our Heavenly Father's face. When he says his, his children walk in his ways, he sees uh, that love. Uh, it says, if you, if you can't love your brother and your sister who you can see, how can you love God who you can't see? When we treat each other with love and respect, then That's that a is a real practical thing, it, too. Yeah. To help those that are hurt, the injustice, to make and stand up for those that, that are, are being uh, persecuted, those that have no voice or are afraid to use their voice, and to stand up, for, there's so many or things. Or just too weak, right? We're, we're all on our own journey. There are some that are still on milk and haven't reached the... That's so right. It's that, that's that right. patience, that encouragement. And right. I and love what you said, that that's the practical application of it, is that Christ, where it says here, his priestly ministry, that, that's sometimes hard to show to someone who might not have a full concept of what's taking place right now. Mm -hmm. But I like how you said, it's when we show them love and we're almost mediating for them not certainly not in in the the priestly role but that we are we are praying giving god permission to work in their lives we are looking for ways we can help them right, right. that's a type of mediation as well because what it's doing is it's drawing them in right so you know, i was thinking too uh when i read this and i can't remember which day it is on the practical, and that's the practical thing, which is really the, the key word. Uh, Jesus says, you know, at, at the end, at the judgment that we're talking about, he's going to take the sheep and the goats. Yes. And the goats are going to be put on his left. And he says, when I was here, you didn't feed me when I was hungry. Yes. You didn't visit me when I was sick. You didn't come to me when I was in prison. And he said, well, when did we do that? And they're He's, legitimately shocked. Yes. They have all of this, like, and, oh, it, look at, I faithfully paid my tithe, I've done, yes. you know. And, and he says, check, because check. you didn't do it to the least of these, my yeah. brethren, you didn't do it to me. 
So when we don't show that love for, you know, there are people, I mean, I've been uh, to some countries, I, they don't have the price of a nail. And, and to see them suffering, you know, and to see that we can put a 60-inch TV on our, on our wall and to know that they're hungry is not, there's something wrong with that. And, you know, we need to, to sacrifice a little bit for those because those are God's children. And those people have, and, you know, they have faith. Uh, it's amazing what we can do. We have so much in this country and how we could use that for those people. And, this, and Jesus says, but when you, when you fed those poor, when you visited the, the prison, those people in prison, uh, then he said, this is what you did for me. You did it to me. And so if we want to, sh you know, how do we love Jesus? Because how do we love Jesus? Because he loves us. We, it's no, it. But how do we do that? We do that by helping others. Yes. Um, That's the most practical application. I have some yeah. Here too, yeah. So this, this is not, uh, we, can, we can have praise and we can, uh, we can do a lot with our lips and, and that glorifies God. Yeah. But if we're not doing something practically to help the suffering of those people, not even people that believe in Christ, because we can help. We did that for one family that was so dying in Philippines that they were actually left in a room. It's, it's quite a story. They were left in a room to die with a mother with a six-month-old six baby. And they were left in a room, a, a prostitute house. They gave her a bed to die. And we went there to help her and got her better. She became a Seventh-day Adventist, her whole family, her husband. What, what it can do, just a little bit we can give. It's, it's amazing. And you know, we, we, we say, what can we do? There's so many people like that. Yes. We just pray that God can find us a way because the practical ways, there are things we can Let do. Let him lead. Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. I, that reminds me when we were on our way to church one day. This was in Williams Lake, and, and my dad had this um, big van that looked like a bumblebee. It was brown with a yellow stripe on its side, but it had lots of seats because my parents always had lots of foster kids, and it was a lean weekend where I think there was just a couple of few of us, and we had gotten out of the house a little bit late. My dad was always very patient. He would just sit in the van, wait for us. And so we're on our way to church. And my sister had to do something up front. And so she was getting a little agitated with you know, the red lights and slowly making our way. And all of a sudden, on the side of the road was a station wagon with clearly a flat tire, jam-packed full of kids and a, a very frazzled looking woman out staring at the flat tire and my dad of course pulls over and my sister's like we're gonna be late for church and he turned and he said this is church this is how you do church so not only did he try to change the flat tire which she didn't have a proper little donut so he hauled his out of his van and had to make sure that she got with all the kids to the gas station and he made sure that she was going to be taken care of by the mechanic and got back you know his little spare donut and by the time we got to church it was well past you know and my, my sister still was able to get up for her portion but i just remember how just calmly this is his practical way that this is how we do church it's not always in a building. It's a practical way of showing God's love. So going on to Monday, you have come to God, the judge of all. So I sort of combined um, Monday and, and Tuesday together a little bit because I thought that the theme um, was very much related. So what spoke to me was Christ's primary work as high priest is judgment. So as I just asked, do we as a people share away from the term judgment? Is judgment a reason for celebration? Does judgment give us assurance? And if yes or no, 
Should everyone have assurance in this judgment? Fair enough. And does judgment contrast a person's profession with their character? And what I mean by that is, um, this is I got from Christ Object Lessons. I'll just read it quickly. The lips may per- express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. While speaking to God in poverty of spirit, the heart may be swelling with the conceit of its own superior humility and exalted righteousness. In one way, only can a true knowledge of self be obtained. We must behold Christ. It is ignorance of him that makes men so uplifted in their own righteousness. When we contemplate his purity and excellence, we shall see our own weakness and poverty and defects as they really are. We shall see ourselves lost and hopeless, clad in garments of self-righteousness like every other sinner. We shall see that we, if we are ever saved, it will be through, uh, not through our own goodness, but through God's infinite grace. So I thought there's, when we have come to God, the judge of all, I think we've got to have a spirit of humility and be fully aware of who we are standing before. And I know that there's lots that is written on the purpose of the pre-advent judgment, but the author of our lesson this week, um, Dr. Felix Cortez, he expounded on it. I just wanted to share it with you. He did a really good job with this part. You may wonder why the judgment scene of Hebrews 12, 22 to 24 is joyous. It certainly does not fit the gloomy version that some Adventists have developed about the pre-Advent judgment at a time in which believers appear alone to be scrutinized before the judgment seat of an almighty and holy God and a retinue of innumerable angels. The truth is that the gloomy view of the pre-advent judgment does not fit into the prophecy of Daniel 7 and 8 or the prophecies of Revelation either. In the prophecies of Daniel 7 and 8, the judgment is carried out to deliver the saints from the attacks of the little horn and restore them to God's kingdom. In the prophecies of Revelation, the saints cry out to God, desperate for him to begin the judgment. Later on, the judgment is announced as the good news of the gospel. Similarly, the announcement in Haggai that God will shake heaven and earth is considered good news for the people of God. The reference to the shaking of heaven and earth in Hebrews 12, 25 to 27 is significant. In the Old Testament, the shaking of the earth is is a common occurrence when God shows up to deliver his people. When Deborah and Barak fought against King Jabin of Canaan, and Sisera, the commander of his army, army, God fought from heaven on their behalf in Judges 5.20. It is described as a powerful earthquake, a shaking of the earth and mountains because of the presence of the Lord. This same image appears throughout the Old Testament when God appears to deliver the oppressed. Thus, shaking becomes a signal of God's judgment on the oppressors. In the prophets, it happens in the context of the day of the Lord. Haggai promised that God would shake the heavens and the earth and all the nations and fill the temple with glory by bringing the nation's treasures to the temple they were building. He explained this in, his, in the oracles pronounced two months later. On the 24th of the ninth month, 520 BC, the oracles explained that the Lord would overthrow the kingdoms and their armies and then establish his own kingdom in Jerusalem from the line of David, represented by Zerubbabel giving him total authority like that represented by a signet ring. The purpose of the judgments predicted in the prophecies of Daniel 7 and Haggai 2 is then favorable for the people of God because they have the purpose of delivering his people from their enemies. And I thought that is, it's so comforting to know that this is the purpose that we we don't need to fear the judgment. We, if, if anything, we should run towards it. And I thought this was interesting too. So the judgment brings into view 
the contents of our heart. So it's not that God doesn't know about the things, these things already, but we stand accountable so that we, it helps us, so that we can see how reasonable and dynamic his judgments are. Nothing that we are called out on is going to be a surprise for anyone. When Jesus goes over something in my life that isn't in harmony with God's will, he's not doing this in some remote corner of heaven that I have no idea about. He sends the Holy Spirit to point it out to me, to convict me, to correct me, so that I now, while I still have time with the mediator in the sanctuary, I can repent and put that sin away by which is done in his strength. This is a positive aspect of judgment. There is no point where anyone will be shocked and declared, wow, I didn't see this coming. I had no idea I was doing wrong things. And so now I'm lost. It's not fair. No. In Hebrews 12, we find this beautiful work of chastening. And we're told that who God loves is who he chastens. Yes. So Tuesday expands on the work of a high priest that it exceeds just the work of, of a priest. So both, though both work in the sanctuary, a priest's work was limited to intercession in the holy place, while the high priest's work extends to the judgment in the most holy place. And we can find that in Leviticus 16. So at the time that Hebrews was written, Christ's work was in the holy place, and Paul repeatedly pointed people toward forward to his high priestly work of judgment. So could I have someone read, um, Peter, would you read Acts 17, verse 30 and 31? Okay. Acts, Acts. Acts 17, 30 and 31. 17, 31. Acts 17, 30 and 31. 17, 30 and 31. And the time of this ignorant God wings at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent, because he had appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he had ordained, whereof he had given assurance unto all men, in that he had raised him from the dead. So that certainly speaks to us about his high priestly work of the judgment. And then, um, could I get, Marco, if you don't mind, Letty, would you read 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11? Second Corinthians 5, 10, verse 11, and 10, sorry, 5, verse 10 and 11. 10 and 11. Yes. Second Corinthians 5, 10, 11 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each, of our, each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Mm. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuaded men but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in, our, in your consciences. So one of the questions that I asked was, does judgment give us assurance? And should everyone have assurance in this judgment? And I f found the answer to that. So if I could get someone to read um, Hebrews 10... 26 to 31. Lorraine, are you okay to read that? Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. And I think this answers our question of, of does judgment give assurance and should everyone have that assurance? Hebrews 10, 36. 26 to 31. 26, okay. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. 
How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So I think that shows that those that don't have the assurance of a favorable judgment are those that have done these things, has trampled on his law, that has willfully... Yeah, basically it's not accepting the, the grace, the merciful grace, yeah. salvation through Christ. They, because what Christ uh, offers us is just that, bring it to me. Yep. Bring it to me. Just put all on me. And then God looks at Christ. He doesn't look at you. So when we do not accept Jesus, our, our, our inter, uh, mediator, so we become just what we are. And we pure stand sin. there, yes, with all our sinfulness and filthiness. And I think thinking minds, critical thinking minds, are going to, ex are going to accept that, yes, God's judgment on me is correct because I am all these things. There's no hiding from it. So moving on to, yeah, please. Yeah, um, the assurance is really important because yeah. we need to have confidence in what God can do and less confidence in what we can do. And it came to me quite a while ago the, the thought that says, when I look at Terry and I look at him completely, I don't see how I could ever be saved. But when I look at Jesus, I don't see how I could ever be lost. Yes. And that's <clears throat> get our minds off of us and our failures. And Ellen White says, that's the worst thing you can do is think about your failures, talk about your failures, talk about the power of Christ, talk about his mighty saving grace and that will, will change the mind even, because the mouth can actually affect the mind. And we start to talk faith, we'll have faith. And if we look at Christ, we'll be changed, as it says. We'll be, as we behold, we'll be changed. And I love that on, on just uh, the paragraph on Mondays at the bottom, this judgment is then really good news for believers because it is a judgment that rules in their favor. It vindicates them. It is a judgment that defeats their adversary, the dragon, who is behind the terrible beasts that have persecuted believers in the past and will do so in the future. So we know that the judgment is in our favor, and our favor is Christ's merits accounted to us, our, uh, literally credited to our account. Nothing's more beautiful. So talking about the shaking of the heavens and the earth, what we've read here, that we can see that the shaking signals God's judgment as he asserts his authority over the peoples of the earth. And that the shaking of the heavens and the earth means then the destruction of the earthly powers that persecute God's people. And more importantly, the destruction of the evil powers, Satan and his angels, who stand behind the earthly powers and control them. So the question at the bottom, why is the promise that one day justice will be done and that the evil that has been so prevalent in our world will one day be destroyed such a hopeful promise for us, especially those that have suffered directly at the hands of evil? So... I ask that only because we're not to be vindictive. What, what was just read, um, Lorraine touched on, where God says, vengeance will be mine. So is it practical for us to look forward to those being held accountable who have maybe done horrible things to us? Or where's the fine line then between turning the other cheek loving and praying for your enemies so this question is it how do we reconcile that that we have this evil it's prevalent in our world there's nowhere you can look right now and not see suffering 
But then if we have been the ones suffering ourselves, are, are we allowed to have some satisfaction at the judgment of, of God that is... I, I, I think it's more the consequence though, of, because uh, evil is going to be gone. Yeah. If evil is gone, suffering is gone. So I think our satisfaction, if you can say it like that, it's that because all the suffering, everything is done, all the tears are gone. No more cry, yeah. right? Um, because I imagine even if for a, a, as a father, if I see your child doing something there, this child is not supposed to do or going to a, to, to a road that shouldn't be going. So it, it, it gives you, I mean, it, it's a lot of a suffering. Yes. But when it ends, and I mean, if you offer everything for that child, the day that is gone, so there is peace. I mean, I think God for us might be a, 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 a very uh, happy day, but I think God... I don't know if it's going to be the same. I mean, he's going to be happy that evil is gone, but I mean, most of these people, he gave, well, he gave yes, his life for, for all, everyone. And he takes no satisfaction in their suffering, but yeah. it's his strange act. Mm -hmm. I just, I like what you touched on. And I actually wrote that is because as long as sin exists, I cannot be in the presence of God or see the f actual face of my savior. So to have sin be no more and be reun reunited to him, there is beyond satisfaction. And there's things that have to take place before that is achieved. So, so something just to think about. So um, something really beautiful about um, Wednesday and Thursday, even right through Friday, is um, let us be grateful. So Christ judges before and after the second coming and that we can live victoriously by faith in Jesus. So a couple of um, some beautiful um, quotes from the lesson is, during the thousand years before the first and second resurrection, the judgment of the wicked takes place. At this time, the righteous reign as kings and priests unto God John, in the Revelation, says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. It is at this time that, as foretold by Paul, the saints shall judge the world. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2. In union with Christ, they shall judge the wicked, comparing their acts with the statute book the Bible, and deciding every case according to the de de deeds done in the body. Then the portion which the wicked must suffer is meted out according to their works, and it is recorded against their names in the book of death. So th that was on um, first paragraph on Friday out of uh, the great controversy. So this sort of lent into, are we able to look forward to with confidence? We, we know we have assurance if we're covered by Christ's righteousness, I think it's tricky. We, we don't, I don't think we are going to rejoice and celebrate like, hey, you're getting what you got. You know, you deserve this. I don't think we, we're going to be changed. And like you said, Terry, we're not even going to be aware that we've been made perfect. And so we will have, I think, the spirit of, of God where there will be the sadness for the loss but the rejoicing that it has finally come to an end, and that's worth celebrating. So I just thought I would close um, with just the last word. Um, it was from Steps to Christ, and she speaks so eloquently and perfectly about the character of God and what it means to know him. Our God is a tender, merciful Father, and his service should not be looked upon as a heart-saddening, distressing exercise. It should be a pleasure to worship the Lord and take part in his work. God would not have his children for whom so great salvation has been provided act as if he were a hard, exacting taskmaster. He is their best friend, and when they worship him, he expects to be with them, to bless them, comfort them, filling their hearts, with joy and love. The Lord desires his children to take comfort in his service and to find more pleasure than hardship in his work. 
He desires that those who come to worship him shall carry away with them precious thoughts of his care and his love. And they may be cheered with all the employment of daily life that they may have grace to deal honestly and faithfully in all things. The soul may ascend nearer heaven on wings of praise. God is worshiped with song and music in the courts above, and as we express our gratitude, we are approximating to the worship of the heavenly host, whose offering praise glorifieth God, Psalms 50, verse 23. So let us, with reverent joy, come before our creator with thanksgiving and the melody, the voice of melody. And that's from Isaiah 51, verse 3. So I found the theme, and I just sort of condensed it to this one last little quote. Our only safety is in constant distrust of self and constant dependence on Christ. So thank you so much for your participation. I thought maybe we'll just close with prayer. Is there someone that would close us with prayer? Thank you. Thank you. You took it. Okay, let's, uh, let's uh, bow our head for prayer. Our dear God, Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this Sabbath and the uh, Sabbath lesson, Sabbath school lesson that you are teaching us your way, that you are the way, the, the truth, and the life. And Lord, we want to be in heaven with you one day and our loved ones. And... Uh, Pray, Heavenly Father, for, um, for your grace and mercy. Um, and we, are that we honor you for ever and ever. Yeah. And um, help us to walk with you. Help us to, um, to come before you in everything that we do. Help us to... Uh, do your will in our lives and our um, our service for you. We thank you so much for bringing us again together, together in your name this morning. We pray that you're in our midst today mm. and uh, help us remember who you are in our lives and um, that you are you are our loving Father. We you are our uh, Redeemer, and we can even call you brother. We thank you so much for everything. Please be with those people who are on the way to church today, and those people who are in, uh, at, uh, at home, not well, whatever circumstances that they are not, can, could not be here today. May you be, um, be with them and be close to them as well. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Check, check, check.
Good morning and happy Sabbath, everybody. Welcome to Pathfinder, our Youth Day Sabbath. We are so happy to have you here. We have the Pathfinders to lead us in the worship this morning, and we uh, hope that you will uh, join us and enjoy in praise and singing. We'll start with 672, Spirit of the Living God. Happy Sabbath. Um, so all I know so far for announcements is that there is the $150, I think, discount on summer camp this year for the youth and the teens and the kids ages 7 to 12, I think it is. Um, and that's all I know. Oh, there will be youth, youth Vespers next week as well. Uh, Friday from 5 till 8 in the, in the gym. Um, does the pastor have any? Oh, there's a closed drive? Oh, wait, April 3rd, there's a closed drive. Hmm? Okay, so you can give your clothes that you don't fit or don't want anymore. To Sandra. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Jesse, and uh, for the announcement. On behalf of the church, I would like to welcome everyone. Happy Sabbath, church. Glad to have you here. We have a special Sabbath for our young people. But find us taking our program. They look wonderful. They look amazing. You guys are awesome. Just want to say thank you for all the leaders for putting all this together and taking charge on this Sabbath. You know, you give me a break. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that I don't need to be in the front here. But I just want to bring your attention to a bulletin announcement. We have a very important uh, evangelistic meeting coming up, starting on uh, April the 21st at 7 p.m. right here at the church. Uh, there's going to be a video with Sean Boonstra from The Voice of Prophecy, and then I will have part of it, which is a half an hour that we will have question and answer to uh, discuss. It will be about four sessions. Uh, we will start Thursday, Friday, and then we'll have on Sabbath twice during the worship service and then in the evening. And then the following week, we'll continue with a, another four more sessions. And we are hoping by God's grace, we will have a baptism. Amen. I have been doing Bible studies with some of our young people who are, you know, trying to give their heart to Jesus through uh, baptism. And I'm asking you, please, if it is possible, if you know anyone who would like to do Bible study, do Bible study with them. Encourage them. We are living in a very interesting time that we need to work and prepare men and women, boys and girls, that Jesus is coming again. And we need to let them to get ready for Jesus coming. Because the moment, the day that we are living in, my friend, my brothers and sisters, is telling us we are living almost at the age of that Jesus is about to come. And we need to get ready, all of us as a church, and we need to get our family members, neighbors, to get ready for the coming of Jesus. So I want to encourage you for that. And that's what we are here for. We are for spreading the good news of Jesus' second coming, where he can bring all the atrocity that we see, the sickness and the disease that we see, the, the anger that we see in our world today. Jesus will come and bring it to an end, where we can live with him for eternity. What, that's what he promised for us. So, uh, last week or the week two, we have two information here. One of them that uh, reached your community with this pow uh, powerful event. 
is asking a question, how would you like to get involved in this event? Number one, you can attend the event, you can invite somebody, you can volunteer, and then you can pray. And thank you for those of you who have returned this form. If, you're, if you still have this form, please fill in your name and phone number and check where you would like to get involved. And if you don't have any, uh, Cedric has uh, a few of them. So raise up your hand, he can give it to you, and then you can fill it in. The second one is about prayer. Uh, if you're not able to do anything much, there's only one thing you can do. Pray. Pray for this event, that it will be successful. That men, and even us, will be revived. Part of this event is also revival. It's not only for the new members. It's for all of us. And I encourage you, coming that day, and I will be talking with our children ministry department, that if you have children, you bring your children. We'll plan to have something for them so that the parents can come and attend this evangelistic meeting. So one other thing that I would like to encourage is called prayer card. This prayer card, it has on the back side of it, list names of people you would like to pray for, people you would like to invite for this event. People you would like to see that they give their heart to Jesus and prepare for his second coming. So there's anything, everything, any one of us can do. Just either you pray or you volunteer or you attend the event or you invite somebody. Or you can even give a ride if there's people who needed to come here and they don't have transportation to get here. You can do that. So I just want to encourage you. Let's continue to pray for this. Yeah, evangelism for me is not an event. It is a daily lifestyle. Amen? Is our daily lifestyle. And so I want to bring uh, also, usually I like to recognize birthdays, and this is my Sabbath, last Sabbath to be here in this church uh, as uh, of this month, and then the next month, of course. So I have a few names here uh, that are celebrating their birthday. I'm not going to call all of them. If you're here, you're celebrating your birthday this month, please come and join me in the front here. If you haven't done before, Amito, come up here, or Chaya, come up here, and who else? Redeen. Redeen? No, it's not done. You haven't come in front here. <laughs> nice try. Gemma? Do we have Gemma here? Shine? Lila? Samuel? Silas? Come on in front here. Nice try. Or Chaya? Luke? Kiara, Mike, Silas. Anybody else whose birthday is this month? I'd like to have a special prayer for you that God will increase your years in this world. See how beautiful, wonderful they look. You guys look younger and younger, right? I know my daughter was looking forward. I can't wait for my birthday. I can't wait. You know, some of us, we don't want to I don't want my birthday to come because, I, you know, it's getting old and only don't like that. We don't like to celebrate. I just want to say uh, thank you for being here. And we cherish you guys. And God has kept you this far. There's people who didn't make it to this far. And we need to be thankful for that. So I'm going to pray for all of you. Okay? Let's pray. Every, and all the church family, let's pray. Dear God, we are so glad to celebrate birthdays. Above all, we would like also to celebrate the birthday of the world. You say in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Today, that celebration of the Sabbath is the birthday of the world. To remind us that you are God, you created us in your image. You have given us the Sabbath as a memorial, as a remembrance of your creation. I want to pray for your children who are here, Lord that you have taken care of them, you have watched over them when they came into this world as they celebrate their birthday this month, Lord. It is my prayer that you will continue to nurture them, to strengthen them, and to increase in knowledge and in wisdom. And that, Lord, they will be a witnesses for you. Thank you so much. May you anoint them with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy birthday, guys. We're not going to sing, but we'll sing next time.
wonder of it all, hymn number 75.
I sing the mighty power of God in 88.
trust in Jesus. Hymn number 524. Uh, we are now going to have a uh, prayer song. Please kneel. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful youth slash Pathfinder Sabbath that we can, all, all the kids, all the youth can do the church service today and a wonderful day for, to be here when the sun is shining and it is a wonderful day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Our offering twice a month is for church budget. Our budget goes to support not just the lights and heat of our building, but also Christian education, health ministries, and Sabbath school, and of course, Pathfinders, among many other items. Our church budget this year is 84000 which works out to need a, of 7000 per month. It takes everyone to help support for this amount. God blesses the cheer, cheerful giver. So please give out the thankfulness of your heart for all he has done for you. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the Sabbath day. And please bless the money that is going towards the church and uh, help the church uh, support the community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Wait, did someone say my name? No, okay. Um, hey guys, welcome to Children's Story. Uh, today I will be sharing a story about dealing with conflict and resolution. So one day my classmates were having a conversation about events that were happening around the world. And people started to agree to disagree with each other's opinions, and this resulted in people being rude and hurting people's feelings, which isn't good. The supervisors had to intervene and remind everyone to be kind, respectful, and patient with each other. This reminds me that we can face these kinds of situations on a daily basis, whether it be with your parents, your siblings, your friends, or even your coworkers, if you go to work, we have to remember that in Proverbs 10:12 it says, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers all wrongs. And with that, I'd like to end it with Matthew 22, verse 33 to 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbors as yourself. Let's keep that in mind. And you guys can go grab your baskets now.
gentle healer came into our town today. He touched blind eyes and the darkness left to stay. But more than the blindness, he took their sins away. The gentle healer came into our town today. The gentle healer came into our town today. He spoke one word and that was all he had to say. The one who had died just rose up straight away. The gentle healer came into our town today. Oh, he seems like just an ordinary man With dirty feet and rubs the gentle hands But the words he says are hard to understand And yet he seems like just an ordinary man The gentle healer, he left our town today I just looked around and found he'd gone away. Some folks from town have fallen him, they say. That the gentle healer is the truth, the light, the way. Our, th our theme today is conflict resolution. So the Pathfinders have prepared a play for you. Um, so you have to watch, there's no talking. Sorry, while they're preparing, I will tell you about a little bit of what we've done this year. So Pathfinders run September to June, and um, in, the, in the beginning of the year, um, we went to Manning Park. Uh, it was not our usual kind of camping. We <laughs> stayed in a cabin, and the kids did a lot of um, fun activities. Um, and then things kind of changed and we've been covering nutrition and uh, mechanics and um, I'm sorry, sorry. Um, what else have we done? Digestion, we just finished doing the um, GI track for, for Pathfinders. So we're looking forward to a few more months of um, fun and entertaining things, but educational as well. I think they're almost ready to go. Just let me check.
Where are you? Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I command you not to eat from? Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading will be found in Galatians 5, verse 13. For brethren, ye ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love to serve one another. use this for now. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? No. Just keep talking through it. Hello, hello, hello. 
Good morning and happy Sabbath again. Thank you so much for being here and um, worshiping with us. Thank you for the opportunity to let the Pathfinders and us leaders lead the kids to um, lead and worship. Uh, it is really important that uh, kids learn how to uh, be a part of worship and have joy doing it. I think that they did an awesome job doing the skit, don't you think? Amen. Yes. Um, so the title this morning uh, for the sermon is At the Cross. Uh, many of you know, um, we, I am new to Chilliwack Church and so is my family. We've just moved here maybe a year and a half ago. Uh, we used to move around uh, in Lower Mainland a lot. And one time we um, actually lived in Burnaby. And we used to um, take every weekend to drive down to Stanley Park. I remember I, I felt like it was every weekend that we did this. We just loved the park so much. And so we would take on Kingsway from Burnaby and all the way down to um, Stanley Park. And we noticed that there was a lot of intersections. There was a lot of red lights. So it would kind of deter our journey. It felt like it, was, it would take forever just to get to the destination. But... Um, we still love to go. So anyways, one day we decided, why not actually count how many red lights there were from our house all the way to the park. And by the end of our journey, we actually counted almost 100 red lights. It was a lot, I know. It took about an hour and a half just to get there. And then if there's traffic, you know how it is in Vancouver. So we live day to day having to cross many intersections. And these intersections are interactions we have with one another and with ourselves. These intersections may turn into a conflict and it challenges us to make a choice. As you can see in the skit, Adam and Eve had a choice. They can only make one choice. And they, cho and they chose one that is out of God's plan. One day when I came to work, um, I found myself not um, just passing through a conflict, but I was in the middle of one. I was in a heated conflict. Redeployment is one of the most despised words that a nurse can hear because it simply means that you are not going to be working at the place that you thought you were going to be working at. <laughs> so it means that you would be uh, relocated to another floor, a completely different unit with completely different people, different assignment, different patients, different everything, and you have to recuperate yourself and learn to adjust. Sometimes you're lucky enough to just move to another unit within the hospital. In the worst case scenario, you just have to go to another hospital. Um, thankfully, this story just involves me going to another um, floor. So. That day, there was an overcount of nurses on the floor, and this, is, uh, this always happens, and some units are left with uh, shortage, and so to balance it off, one or two people would have to uh, be sent away and go to the other place to, to make sure that there is enough um, nurses there. So that day, it was between me and another nurse to decide who's staying, who's going. I certainly did not want to go because I was scheduled to work there and I was determined to stay as, as whatever it took, I was determined to stay and I thought in my mind, if I can't stay, I'm just gonna go home. <laughs> but um, the other nurse was also scheduled to work on that day. And in this particular unit, you only need two nurses, one RN and one LPN. There was two RNs, so only one of us could stay. And um, she said, oh, I was pre-booked here a month ago. And I said, well, I got hired here two weeks ago. <laughs> and, and this is my line. This is my schedule. And she said, well, I'm not going to that floor, wherever uh, they're sending us. And I said, well, what do we do here? She said, well, I don't know, but I'm staying. And there's a lot of attitude and feistiness that goes around. But um, at that moment, I was, I was so angry because I was so excited to work, to come to the unit that I chose to work in. But 
I was faced with this conflict. Do I, do I stick my ground and say, no, I'm going to stay here and you need to go, even though I'm a newer nurse and she's an older nurse. So there was a lot of things that was going on in my mind. But um, the one voice that I heard is the Holy Spirit. And he, he said, swallow your pride and go. Just swallow your pride and go. What, what's, what's it going to do? You're still a nurse, no? You're still here to serve people and it doesn't matter where you go as long as you are serving with a happy heart. So um, I obeyed the action, but I was still furious. I was full of envy, and what I did was I took my nursing paper notes, whatever, report, and just slapped it on the table and dozed off the unit. Not a Christian thing to do, okay? Not a Christian thing to do, but that's what I did. And when I got to the other floor, I was, I was still you know, boiling inside. My head was, you know, just, I don't know, red and hot, and I needed to cool down. I really needed to cool down. And um, what I did was I had to go to my prayer room, which was the washroom, and, and I had to beg God, Lord, I, I know I am wrong to feel this way. I know that I need to be calm. I know I, I you know, all those things. We know what is right to do. Right? But a lot of times we struggle. And this is the, the greatest conflict that we have in our lives is inside of us. My mind was racing. I was conflicted between two school of thoughts. One provoked me to rage and resentment, while the other chastened my pride and said, um, look to Jesus. Remember that he was shamed. He was, he was um, humiliated in front of everybody. But yet, how did he handle it? Can you do that? Can you step up to the plate today, tonight? And I said, well, I want to, Lord. What? And then he said, and God said, well, you can. You can, because I'm going to help you to, but you need to believe that you can. So I prayed and pleaded, and I prayed and pleaded, and finally, you know, the moment that you let go and surrender yourself to God, God enables you to do things that you never would have imagined that you can do. And at that time, I did not imagine myself to actually let go of my anger and continue on and work because I still had 12 hours to go. Um, I thought, you know what, there, there are people here depending on me, needing me to take care of them, and I can't come into their room feeling all stormy inside because there's no way that I can have compassion with that. It took me about an hour and a half to really cool down. Realistically, that, that's how it, it went down. But I hope the next time I can shorten that, that time and be able to resist evil thoughts at the first, the first time that it actually appears. Bef you know, instead of like arguing and you know. Anyways, so now I bring you the question. What choices did you make when you had to cross, when you, had, when you were in a crossroad, uh, in, in the middle of a heated argument, disagreement, whether it's with another brother or sister, or maybe it's with yourself inside of you? What, um, what did you do? Some of us may deal with conflict this way. It's about competition, us versus them. We are right, they are wrong, or, you know, I can't believe why they can't get their mind, like, their stuff together. You know, it's all about competition. Others, like me, I like to avoid conflict, but other than, yeah, I like to avoid conflict. That's why I just said, okay, I'll go. But inside, I was just, you know, boiling. Um, some people who avoid things that, you know, by not being present in the conflict, that they're resolving it out of sight, out of mind. I call them bystanders. I call myself bystanders. Some people want, um, some people choose compromise. So they're torn between following God and wanting to please people. How many times have you been in that situation? 
I know what is right to do, but at the same time, I don't want this person to not like me. Because of the position that I am in, in, ch in church, how am I supposed to keep them? You fill in the blank. But some true leaders, true Christian leaders, learn to collaborate. They learn to respect, number one, respect, and number two, actually listen. Listen to the other side, or maybe there's no size. In their mind, there's no size. There's just, we are family. We need to come together and listen to each other because we need to understand. We need to establish an understanding and actually work, move forward to work towards a resolution. And as a Christian, what is our resolution? Prayer and fasting. If you don't know where, you, where to go, if you don't know what to do, no idea, everything is a blur, you need to get on your knees and pray. Because it is through prayer that we are brought back to the foot of the cross. Our eyes are drawn back to Jesus, fixated on him and not at other people. Amen. Not at the media. Not what the government says. Not what my, my neighbor says. Not, my, not what my best friend said. Or not even what I say. My own logic. No. You need to come to the cross. We need to come to the cross. It is at the cross that we find the template of how to resolve conflict. The greatest controversy ever happened in human history, in all of the universe's history, the great controversy was resolved on the cross. What does the cross represent? God made Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. It is at the cross that we are reminded of our identity and purpose. We as church, we are to lift God's name in everything that we do, even in our thoughts towards one another. Right? We might be thinking bad things about one another, and that is not good. At the cross, we find the way, the truth, and the life, and that is Jesus Christ alone. So in this past week, have you come to the cross when you face conflict? Did you resolve your conflict at the cross? Let's review how God resolves conflict. Number one, he seeks first. He said to Adam and Eve, where are you? That means he's the one to initiate that process. Don't wait for the other person to come to you and say, I'm so sorry. Da, 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 da. You're just going to be in that place of resentment for a long time. And the only person that you're inflicting is yourself. God said, where are you? He sought to understand and not be understood he didn't say you know how can you not trust me how can he didn't say any of those stuff he said where are you who told you that you were naked and have you and he verified what happened have you eaten from the fruit of the tree that i commanded you not to eat In times of conflict, do you go to the other person and ask, what's happening here? Can I understand you better? Number two, God loved first. He went the second mile, and we know this verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved. It was only love that drove him to come down to this earth, this filthy earth, and became a human being. It is so degrading for a God, the creator of the universe, to be a human who is dirty. But yet he did that because he wanted to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And, number, and third, he forgave first. He said, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. How many times have we been the one to say, Lord, I know that I was hurt. I know that the other person actually did wrong to me, but can you please forgive them? 
Can you help me forgive them? When you think about your most recent or biggest intersections of problems you had to cross, did you seek first to understand? Or did you want to justify and rectify your own belief, your own opinions? Did you do the unthinkable to love first? Or did your pride laugh at the idea? Did you forgive first even if you were the one who was actually wronged? Or did you grip onto resentment? Galatians 5.13, that's our memory verse. For brethren, it says, ye have been called unto liberty. You know, we live in a day of age where it's all about rights. My rights, your rights, their rights, whatever. Fill in the blank. But Bible talks also about liberty, about freedom. And it says, you have been called unto freedom, but do not use your liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. This is a very hard thing to do. We live in a world that is crippling and literally is dying before our eyes. You hear of wars, you hear of devastation that's happening in the world, and there's next thing is food crisis and economic collapse. Everything is going down the toilet. If we believe in the Bible, we would know that we are under evacuation from earth and fleeing to a much better home, which is heaven. We are in a state of emergency, friends. The road to heaven is so treacherous, so narrow. You can't carry much things there. You can't carry your pride. Um, there's no room for pride. There's no room for argument. But there's only room for Jesus in your heart and for you to carry yourself. Are you going to continue to walk in that road? I challenge you, please do. And meet, let's meet together there. My favorite verse in the Bible comes from Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Okay. Are we going this way? The muster station. Where are we going? The white building. The white building. It is snowing. We're going to, to the white building and then into the gym. Towards the gym. Towards the gym. 